Hi, I'm Candace Michelle, and this is Our Community. One of the difficulties faced by performing artists, whether in a theater company, a dance troupe, a choral ensemble, or an orchestra, especially in rural or remote areas such as ours, is often the lack of a space to practice in and perform. My guest today is a man with a vision about how to change that. Nick Grail, the president of the Partnership for Performing Arts. Welcome to the show, Nick. Thank you, Candace. It is such an honor to be here. Oh, it's such a privilege to have you here. <laughs> I mean, I was at the city council meeting back in, I don't remember, the middle of July, the end of July. A couple of weeks ago. It's hard yeah. to remember. Everything mushes together, you know. It does. But the presentation you gave was beautiful. It was exquisite. I mean, you had artists' renderings and architectural stuff. I mean, it was really, it was very impressive. Well, thank you. Yes, the uh, project we have to build a performing arts center on the campus of Del Norte High School to be shared with Del Norte and Curry Counties, uh, that's been a vision and a dream that we're going to turn into reality, and I'm very excited about it. And that's a very ambitious project. When I get up in the morning, I get to go to work. I don't have to go to work. And yep. I get to go to work on raising the money to build the center. That's so life excellent. is good. And I'm, I'm glad you said where it was because I wondered, did you have the place secured where you were going to build it? And I can't think of a better place than that. The, um, the school district volunteered the land for it, and they had the space. So having the space wow. and having adequate parking and having it on a school campus. Isn't Ideally, amazing. I guess we would have it on the state line, so it was the same <laughs> distance between Brookings and Crescent City, but okay. it, at some point you have to make a choice. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So we're going to get into all of the nuts and bolts about this project, but I'd like to start with, you know, kind of getting to know you a little bit, a little bit of your history, you know, where are you from? You know, what part of the universe did you come from? All those things, yeah. yes. <laughs> I rolled off the conveyor belt in 1950 down in Los Angeles. I have an older brother, less than a year old, and my parents. And in 1957, when I was just shy of seven years old, we moved from downtown Los Angeles up to Crescent City. So it was a little bit of a, wow. a shift of focus, let's say. In 1957, there were fewer than 10,000 people in Delaware County. Wow. Timber and fishing were still quite vibrant. Absolutely. Not only did we move to the country, we moved into the country, in the country. We weren't in the city. We were uh, out on uh, South Bank Road. So. Why did your parents think that moving to Crescent City was the thing to do? It just turned out to be the best fit. There were difficulties down in L.A., mm -hmm. and uh, my father needed regular work, and he bought a share in a plywood mill. Wow. Which guarantees you a job. Absolutely. Paycheck. So despite the fact my parents were both college educated, hmm. my, uh, for a variety of reasons, we ended up coming up to Crescent City. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother was a homemaker, and father was making a dollar and a quarter an hour at uh, Medford Veneer and Plywood when we moved up. Which was probably plenty to live on at that time. Plenty, and uh, but we did grow up poor. I had the, mm -hmm. I had the uh, iron-on patches on my pants okay. and things like that. Okay. My older brother, from a very early age, three years old, started to draw and paint, and he was really good at it. And folks would come over and say, my kid's 10 years old, and your brother's drawing circles around that were painting, and I'm scratching my head and say, wow, that's a gift. Do I get a gift? Does everybody get a gift? Is it random? Is he yeah. the only one? Yeah. And I wasn't jealous. I was more mm -hmm. curious. Mm -hmm. And in 1959, my little elementary school out in Fort Dick started school band. They didn't have it before. Oh, how wonderful. And I chose the cornet, which is very similar to a trumpet. Yes. And I was riding the school bus home that day, and I was going to make the pitch, and I was so excited. And I said, ah, my father only makes this amount of money. That's going to be three, four weeks' worth, and we're hand to mouth. They can't afford it, but I'm going to make the pitch anyhow. Mm -hmm. And I did, and I still 
honestly have no idea where they found the money to do it, but they bought the cornet. So wow. three, three magic things happened that day. The school offered a band. My parents said yes. And I found, found my gift of uh, creativity. Oh, that's and wonderful. I still have best friends today that we walked in the band room that same day back in 1959. And that's the power of music. Wow. So. Yeah, yeah. I went through high school, a wonderful time in high school, played, switched from cornet to trumpet. I picked up tenor saxophone, played some bassoon, played flute, jack of all trades, master of a nun, had a great time. Went on to UC Berkeley, UC Santa Barbara, with the intention of becoming a band director. Hmm. But at a point, I hit the tadpole in a tsunami versus you know, big frog small pond. Uh, <laughs> small pond and yeah. I, decided, I know that you know, one, well, yeah. <laughs> I can get my degree, my credential, my job, but by the time I can teach at the level that inspired me, I'll be, oh, 110 or 12 <laughs> years old. And that, that's not fair to the kids. Right. <laughs> so I quit. Interesting. And uh, I went back east, studied band instrument repair, came back to Santa Barbara, worked for somebody else for 10, 12 years, started my own business, and over... Three and a half decades, built it into six stores and the largest school music dealer in California, which means the store offers rentals, retail, repair, and uh, does school bids. We were selling to schools in 46 states. Wow. And a wonderful rental program where parents could buy the instrument without interest and a very, very fair share uh, mm -hmm. equity program for that. And, uh, and that offers kids such an opportunity. I mean, it really, it really does, because a lot of people can't afford to buy instruments for their kids. They just can't, and especially yeah. if they don't know if the kid's going to stick with it, right? So, yes. you know, you buy a trumpet, and, and the kid likes the trumpet for six months and then doesn't want to, right? It's like, oh. Uh. You know, this lets you dip your toe in the water without mm -hmm. too much obligation, mm -hmm. yes. So, a couple of questions. First of all, you were born in 1950? Yes. So was I. What's your birthday? Month of May. So is mine. What's oh, the day? 18. Mine's the 16th. Oh, gosh. Darn it. You got me beat by two You're days. You're a Taurus. I walk in your shadow. How I like that? Tauruses, so <laughs> welcome to the show. How about that? Yes. That's amazing. That's amazing. My yeah. mother always felt I should have been born on the 17th because daylight savings time. I was born <laughs> at 12.01. Wow. And she said, it should have been the 17th. Yeah, yeah. Well, my grandmother was born on the same day, so it seemed to fit. Oh, that's nice. So I remember when I was in grade school, we had, um, I went to Catholic school and in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and they had a, a program where they would bus all of the certain, one certain grade, I think it was, or maybe two grades, into the Syria Mosque where they would have orchestras playing classical music, right? Yeah. I mean, what sixth grader gets to sit in the Syria Mosque, which is this incredible auditorium and listen to like two hours of beautiful classical music. And I, I'll never forget how that felt because I wasn't a fan of classical music. That wasn't, you know, but being in that environment, I, I could just close my eyes and I was transported into a, I don't know, a whole different world. It was amazing, amazing. Yeah, what opportunity. That's fantastic. No kidding, right? I mean, those are the kinds of things that, that we should provide for our children. They need to be able to experience that, have those experiences, yes. know what it feels like. Because you're overwhelmed. You sit in an auditorium like that with classical music all around you, this big, heavy-duty orchestra. It's, it's pretty amazing. Yes, it bathes you and Oh, it really does. You know, such cultural enrichment. Absolutely. So, okay, so you, you were doing repairing and selling and loaning, renting of band instruments. Yes, and we had educational sales reps that went out to schools and helped band I directors with 
rentals or sales or shoulder to cry on, whatever it happened to be. Mm -hmm. So we would see 200, 250 schools a week in eight counties in Southern California. So we were busy. Oh, I bet you were. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So I imagine there are quite a few kids who have you to thank. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it was a a great career of service, uh, Mm -hmm. providing opportunity and even more opportunity that my parents and the school district provided me growing up. So it's just yeah. a gift to be able to continue that in a sense. Absolutely. Um, it was never about money. It was always about service. It was customers, employees first, and then whatever you deserve falls uh, off of the end. Right. And isn't it funny that if that's what you're focused on, the money just kind of makes itself somehow? I mean, it just, you know, you focus on the service and I don't know, the money just somehow it takes care of itself. Comes along. Yeah, it does. I love that. So how did you get involved in the Partnership for Performing Arts? Like, how did that all come to pass? My wife, Lisa, and I got married in 1984, and I started bringing her up to the area to share the beauty of the counties. Mm -hmm. And my parents had long since passed, but Redwoods, rivers, coast, and all that. We had a good time, come up every three, four years. And and where were you living at that point? Down in Santa Barbara. I okay. lived there for 50 years. Oh, that's a beautiful area. And um, one of the uh, customers I had starting when he was about eight years old, nine years old, was Dan Sedgwick. Hmm. Dan Sedgwick is the band director at Del Norte High School. He's oh. In his 15th what? year, so... He grew up taking lessons in my store in Santa Barbara. and um, Isn't it perfect? It's just perfect how things work out. When he was going to Humboldt State and then up uh, getting his master's and teaching credential in Oregon, he worked uh, six summers in my repair shop in Santa Barbara, and I taught him basic repair. And one day he comes in and he says, well, Nick, this is my last summer. I got this job. It's the coolest job ever, but you have no idea. where. I mean, it's out in the middle of... He said, it's a place called Delaware County, Delaware High School. And uh, I said, well, Dan, let's have a chat here. Because as a matter of fact, I know exactly where that is. <laughs> yes. So that was 2008. And then wow. Lisa and I started coming up every year. And I asked Dan, I said, can I round up some of my friends from that first day when I walked in the door at Fort, Fort Dick at Redwood Elementary and joined a band? Can we... Uh, join in the community band, 4th of July, lower the musical quality a little bit, but march along with the kids. Dan said, of course you can. So started doing that. And I also already knew his predecessor, Christy Lynn Rust, who taught in the district for 30 years. And getting into the mid-teens, we would sit down with Dan and Christy Lynn and say, well, what do we need up here? What's missing? Uh, Because this is the area where it all started for for me. Mm -hmm. And I knew that timber and fishing were, the expiry date was. <laughs> yes, it was coming up. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Dan said, well, we're buying used instruments off eBay, picking them, fixing them up as mm-hmm. best we can. I'm thinking, that's like driving a car with flat tires. You know, mm-hmm. first 50 feet, you've never driven a car. It's going to be exciting. But mm-hmm. after that, you might consider another mode of transportation. Yeah. And Christy Lynn said since I've been here over the 30 odd years, we've three times we've tried to build a performing arts center and failed every single time. So Lisa and I had already been talking about this, but when we sold our store in 2019, all six of them, we don't have any kids other than all of our customers and our employees were our kids. It was a very easy decision. The second we had the check, we turned it over and endorsed the entire check to a donor-advised fund at Charles Schwab to support the performing arts and public education up here. So in essence, we gave the entire check away, but we still have the right to manage what it's spent for. Wow, so yeah, we, that's amazing. It was fantastic. We, we were really well-to-do for about 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's a great feeling, but it's a greater yeah, feeling to give it away. Exactly. Exactly. So we moved up here in January 2021. Uh, we'd already start and started to work before then on uh, giving back to the communities. And initially it was focused on Del Norte, but it was just a very short period of time, not even a year, that I realized Curry County had to be part of the process 
uh, erase the state line. There's so many things that we share, yeah. uh, uh, demographics and cultural, every yeah. reason to include both counties in this. And uh, I was also in conversation with Friends of Music and mm -hmm. uh, Brookings Events Concerts, Concert Halls, Beach, with their efforts to build a performing arts mm -hmm. center. Mm -hmm. so I mm -hmm. found out about that maybe around 2018. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew both of us could not build a center. We would both knock each other out. It right. wouldn't be one wins, one loses, and we wouldn't want that either. Right. So we had to decide which one is a go and which one isn't, because otherwise we'd be knocking on the same doors, and it just wouldn't work. Right. So I was introduced to the, the boards of those uh, nonprofits, and we compared our notes, and the decision was made that the Partnership for the Performing Arts had had the the better chance. Great. And Great. Lisa and I moved up here in January of 2021, mm -hmm. and uh, we haven't looked back. Yeah, no kidding. I'm now, glad. Having a great time. We've given uh, well over 500 band instruments and orchestral instruments, mostly new to the two school districts. Two school districts. Wow, um, that's great. Crescent Elk Middle School, which mm -hmm. looked horrible, felt horrible, sounded horrible, built in 1929. And not maintained since then, other than a couple of volunteer paint jobs. Uh, and even the light panel was from 1929, so oh figure out how well that works. So <laughs> we spearheaded the renovation of that and the entire new seats, new floor, new stage. New That's great. Double pane windows, state of the art lighting. So that little small for a middle school, even auditorium, is the closest, it's the only indoor concert, indoor concert venue appropriate for concerts in the whole Del of Del Norte County. That's crazy. And in terms of performing arts centers on the Wild Rivers Coast, there is no performing arts center between Florence, Oregon and Arcata, oh. California. <laughs> so a 240 mile stretch, we're all relegated to our concerts in the band room, concerts in the gym, concerts with horrible acoustics. And you know, the, the crazy thing is in my opinion, we have got so many talented artists in in this area, in Curry and Del Norte, talented. I mean, we've got visual artists, we've got singers, we've got dancers, we've got actors, we've got instruments. I mean, it it's like amazing how talented the people are. And with nowhere to perform, like no... Because they're, you know, they're, the groups are battling each other, trying to, you know, get a place to actually perform. Yes, that has the proper acoustics mm -hmm. and so forth. So, the uh, in addition to giving all these instruments, and we've got, I don't know, I think we've got thirty thousand dollars worth of stuff on order for Brookings Harbor right now. And, oh wow! Uh, a similar order for for Del Norte. We're not done giving on on that side of things. That's uh, great. But the uh, Performing Arts Center. 800 seats, mm. and the sound will be digitally managed so that we can go from the very driest to the very brightest of sound because you need different acoustics for a speaker, for a play, for a choral, mm -hmm. and for a band and so forth. You have to be able to go back and forth to manage it. Otherwise, mm -hmm. one works and another doesn't. Right. Um, our schedule is to be done in late 2027. Um, wow, that's only a few years away. Yes, yes. And it's all predicated on whether the Partnership for the Performing Arts raises close to $45 million. And we're still in early days on that, mm -hmm. but we have done enough work, educated ourselves. We're getting some momentum, and I feel confident that we will get there. But nonetheless, if uh, any of the listeners out there, if you haven't cleaned your sofa yet, a little bit spare change, <laughs> you're welcome to send it our way. We will take it. So. Look underneath those cushions. <laughs> yes, yes. Who knows what's hiding under those cushions? We do have um, some people in the community who have a decent amount of wealth. So, And interestingly, it seems like people who like the arts are the ones who are actually okay with giving that away you know it's just it's it's a nice thing right so yeah i would think that it would not be impossible to find that money you know there, there, there are five different sources of funding for a project like this 
And the the model is a pyramid that's a top-down model. The model doesn't work for our area particularly, but I'll, I'll mention it anyhow. Typically in a project of this size, the top 40% will come from four or five angels. Mm-hmm. People that can write a check for two, three, four, five million. Mm-hmm. And um, those people are difficult to connect with up here. Mm-hmm. And because we, we're in an area, we're in a resource desert where 95% of us can't afford to go to the world. And that's part of the magic of the Performing Arts Centers. We get to bring the world to them. Yes. Uh, yeah. That's uh, really, really exciting. But state state funding, federal funding, corporations, foundations, and then individuals are the five different areas. Mm-hmm. And that's the trick in fundraising for a project like this is getting about halfway because once you're about halfway, then the foundations and corporations, Ford Family Foundation and so forth, you become legitimate in their eyes. And, yep. and then they're willing to kick in 20%, 30%, something like that. Yep. So. yep. Well, there are a number of foundations that are very interested in the arts and very inter- I know in Oregon are very interested in Curry County because they understand that we are a cultural desert. There's not much... You know, here yeah. we're so much a desert. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we're so only bought in a resource desert, and <laughs> and we look at the area, and um, what seven million people a year probably come to, close to seven come here to see the redwoods and so forth. You know, the published number is something like one point five because those people those are the ones that buy an actual ticket. Right. Right. But there are probably three times as many that uh, just stop yeah. somewhere and run off into one of the exactly, groves. Exactly, so because there's lots of places to do that. Yeah. And people who like nature are people who like the arts. Yep. And one thing that the Performing Arts Center will do is these people who visit our counties, and maybe they start in Humboldt and they drive up and they grab a Big Mac and they go out and see their trees and then they end up some other county north of here. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of hospitality industry, we might make two bucks. Yeah. But yeah. if we have a nice performance at the Performing Arts Center, perhaps we can get these people to stay for a day or two. And we had a study done by University of California Davis Co-op Extension, and they made a conservative estimate that once the center is built, it will put close to $2 million annually back into the oh, economy. That's so wonderful. We're looking forward to that. Yeah. yeah, because it makes such a huge difference for a rural community to have that kind of infusion. And with the Performing Arts Center, our, our, our primary, our, our basic vision or rules of, of use are students first, community second, and touring performing groups third. So... The the handshake deal we have, which we will turn into a formal uh, memorandum of understanding, because it's on the Delaware campus, Delaware Unified will have first shot at the calendar. Mm-hmm. Brookings Harbor will have second shot at the calendar. Community nonprofits will have the next shot, and then Mick Jagger and so forth will t- <laughs> come in a fourth third, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the beauty of it is, we st- are in rural America, and there's room for everybody on the calendar, but we're giving priority to education to our youth, to students. And uh, and that's so important. I mean, it's just, you know, I mean, we're, we already have our hands tied behind our back being in a rural community, you know. I mean, you, you just don't have the opportunities. You don't, you don't have the culture. You don't have all of that stuff that goes into you know, kind of waking up the curiosity in the brain, right? So anything that we can do to foster that sense of wonder about the arts, because it's, a, you know, it's an amazing, it's an amazing tool for expression, um, for self-fulfillment. I mean, it's just... Especially in within the scope, the frame of the performing arts, when we have uh, music and choir, so band, Mm -hmm. orchestra, and choir, those students perform 15% higher on SAT tests. So even though they don't take music past high school, they are better equipped to 
enter the workforce directly, have a better chance of getting into college, have a better chance of, as adults, being givers, not takers. Mm -hmm. The definite academic benefit to this. Another thing in a rural community like ours that's impoverished, uh, Del Norte is the fifth most impoverished county in California. And in an area where we have a lot of single parent, at risk, abused kids, suicides, prone, prone, unhoused. Yep. Kids in the performing arts in school, that becomes their secondary family. And when you're at risk, it often becomes the only reason you come to school. Yep. So the performing arts will uh, benefit all of that. And we also get to put the kids on a stage. They feel important. They when, when our kids work all year long and then we're on a flat floor or a very low stage, so whether we're at Brookings Harbor High School or whether we're in Tunin Gym at uh, Del Norte High School, the acoustics are horrible. Yes. The seats <laughs> are not comfortable. No. <laughs> and it's really, really similar. It's worse than playing a football game on a gravel parking lot. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, the music programs at both of the high schools, such a healthy camaraderie, healthy competition. They get along very well. They feed off each other. So, I'm going to get you at this competition. <laughs> well, I got you at that one and so forth. And, and the uh, Wild River Symphony. So we share a lot of things between our two communities. And the center will only build upon that. I love that. Uh, I remember seeing... Um, Nutcracker Suite at uh, Brookings Harbor High, I believe, um, and the seating. So it we, it was bleacher seating, right? Because it was in the auditorium and uh, horrible venue, <laughs> just just horrible, right? There's there's these kids that are out dancing their hearts out and. And the acoustics were bad, and you know, and you can't really see if you're on bleachers. I mean, come on, right? So, and 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 we still enjoy these events because we're celebrating our kids, yes. and uh, with our hearts, yes. But if we have a proper stage, the experience for the people on the stage and the people in the audience both magnified. Yep, immensely. absolutely. We had a. Um, a play that we did. We did a musical in our high school every year. And generally speaking, the seniors were the ones who got the lead roles and then it filtered Juicy down. Parts, yeah. Yes. And the chorus was mostly juniors and some sophomores. You know, generally speaking, freshmen didn't make it into those. I mean, that was something you aspired to. Um, but I distinctly remember how it felt to be part of that. Um, it, it gave you a sense of being somebody, you know? You were somebody. I mean, everybody in the school knew that you were on that stage and what part you played and, you know, and, and it was mostly singing because they were musicals, so you did a lot yeah. of singing, right? And some dancing. It was, it was just such a wonderful opportunity. And you could see that some of the kids who, you know, might have come from, you know, not great homes, not great circumstances, and, and perhaps had not been very self-confident, they just kind of blossomed, you know. Here, here they were on a stage, and people were clapping for them. Yeah, acceptance and confidence, self-worth. Absolutely. Teamwork, friends. You know, to say all those things. Exactly. To say nothing of the time that you spent in rehearsal, right, which gave you a place to be after school, that meant something. You know, you weren't just kind of hanging at the the grocery store, the liquor store, the pharmacy. I mean, you were you were doing something with your time that was useful and, and important. Yes, and teamwork, learning teamwork and Yep. Nothing at all against sports, but we can't play contact football at our age. Uh, no. <laughs> I think we can still play music. And it, so you, so, yes. you learn, uh, it's, uh, 
both both require great teamwork, but it's a little bit different type of teamwork. It's not get the other guy. Let's all succeed as right. a unit together ourselves. Right. And they're both legitimate. They're both needed. Absolutely. Um, and, and uh, you know, there are kids who don't want to participate in sports. So that's just not their thing. Yeah. They want to make music or they want to dance or they want to act. That's what they want to do. Some of my favorite concerts are the beginning kids, the fourth graders, maybe they've only played for three, four months, and it's the winter concert, and they get up on whatever stage they have, and they they kind of take their time getting it. They're a little bit nervous. They're yeah. left and left and right, yeah. and they sit down, and they start to play, and their, their knees are literally knocking. They're scared yes. half to death. Yes, and yes. Maybe they play some right notes. Maybe they play some wrong notes. Maybe it's more in favor of the latter. But at the end of each piece, the audience goes crazy. Yes. And they realize we can do this. And then they realize at the end, we did this. Yes. So they walk in scared half to death. And they walk out 10 feet tall with their shoulders square, grinning from ear to ear. And Every time I watch that, it's like I've been watched it. I've watched it for the first time, yeah. and I can't wait for the next time to watch it. Just the, just the experience those kids have when they get to perform like that. It's I mean, what a sense magic. of accomplishment, right? To to be able to do something that, you know, maybe you thought you weren't actually going to be able to pull it off, you know, and yes. and you did, and they clapped like people out there clapped, and that makes them want. To do more. Yeah, it really does. It really does. Very, very good stuff. So let's talk a little bit about what the physicalness of the um, Performing Arts Center is going to be like. You said 800 seats. Yeah, so the center is uh, located uh, just south of Washington Boulevard. There is an area now that is west of the track football field. That's a gravel parking lot, and there are tennis courts there. That's where the center is going to go, where the gravel parking lot is. Mm -hmm. And that's basically just due north of the band room, just a hop and a skip, maybe 50 feet, something (laughs) like that, to the band room. And the seats will be, it'll be a sloped floor, and the seats are of unequal widths, which means that nobody sits directly behind anybody else so everybody has a wonderful sight line wow. on stage. Wow. And the architects are PBK architects out of Dallas, Texas. They have nine offices in California. Delaware Unified has been working with them for eight, nine years now. They are the nation's largest institutional educational architect, and they're a quality team. Excellent. And we started the design process in April of 23, and we're just about through with it now. We know pretty much within 95% what the center will look like. We have to go down 50 feet and pump in grout for a foundation. There's a high water table there. Oh, interesting. And the footprint is about 26,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. And the arrangement that we'll have the school district, a couple of arrangements. One is the nonprofit partnership for the performing arts is tasked with the capital campaign, raising the money. The school district in charge of design, putting it out to bid, uh, overseeing the construction, and then Partnership for the Performing Arts, or PPA, will run it. Mm -hmm. And um, construction should start in uh, early 2026, about a 17, 18-month build-out. Wow. Once again, if we do our job and raise that money. Yes. (laughs) That darned money. We were able to start the design process thanks to a very generous uh, appropriation from uh, California State Senator Mike McGuire. Uh, We got $2.5 million. Oh, wonderful. I'll have to get us into the design process. Wonderful. So I wonder what the the, uh, Oregon legislature would think about it because you're actually in California, but you'd be serving... Don't, I mean, Curry County is, we'd all be down there a lot. (laughs) We're we're bonded at the hip in many ways. So when we come to the Oregon Foundations, 
I think Oregon Community Foundation and Ford Family Foundation will both be interested at the right time. We've had some good initial conversations with them. Mm-hmm. Um, I have reached or am reaching out to every state and federal representative, senator, and so forth. I had some good meetings with field reps and the folks themselves. Right now, for example, we have a a um, grant request in Washington, D.C. with the House of Appropriations Committee. Senator Merkley sits on another subcommittee. It's mm-hmm. not in his subcommittee, but right. being in touch with these different people and bringing their awareness of who we are and what we're doing and how it's affecting Curry County yeah. is important when it comes to the floor for a vote because um, what's called a federal earmark, this federal earmark we're asking for $1.5 million, Federal government doesn't give out much more than that at any one time to a project like mm-hmm. this, but we are one of 15 of 50 applicants chosen for it, and that wow. right there is a big honor. It certainly is. So when it comes to the floor for a vote, we mm-hmm. want Senator Merkley and Senator Wyden and yep. we want Representative Hoyle to be aware of the project. Absolutely. Oh. Absolutely. And just locally for Oregon, David Brock Smith is our senator for this area to Oregon, and Court Boyce Court. is our rep. So, yes. you know, I, I would reach out to both of them. and We're in process on Good. That, you bet. Good. Yeah. Yes. Because anything that brings, I mean, that it, it, it's sort of been this theme that, you know, well, we're, we're underserved, and because we're underserved, don't expect to get services. Just don't. But the reality is that the state of Oregon knows that we're underserved. The the state of Oregon is aware of the desert that this place can be and is actually paying attention now. They are actually aware that Curry County needs help and they are hmm, thinking about giving it. So I would say this is an excellent time to approach Oregon about Curry County. And our future is only as good as the opportunities we provide for our youth, plain and simple. And going back to the fact that the kids in performing arts perform better in the classroom, Hmm. uh, and going back to the two band directors, Corey Tamandong and Dan Sedgwick, both of those educators, remember I dealt with several thousand band directors in Southern California. I'll put both these band directors up the best of the, against the best of the best. Really? The ones I dealt with in Southern California. We are so blessed to have the music educators we have. Mm -hmm. We've got Cooley at the middle school, and we have not a new to teaching, but new to the position. Marshall Jones will be teaching at Calmeopsis at Mm -hmm. K-School. Great. This year, and that's a solid team. That's great. Just a solid, solid team. I'm so proud of what Corey and Ku has done, and I know Marshall's going to. Uh, Mar- Marshall's been been was at uh, Dillard Unified in the classroom for about thirty wow. thirty years or wow. so, and a founding member of Light Lighthouse, Lighthouse Repertory Theater. Mm-hmm. So, oh, no, nice. no stranger to performing. Right, right. Uh, I'm just excited to see where the and it's so important if you can if you can get those kids at that kind of an early age. I mean, it makes such a huge difference in their lives. Yes, and it it provides balance. We have when I was growing up, they didn't really have the a specific focus for education outside of the three R's, mm-hmm. and then. Starting in the 70s, we came up with the acronym STEAM, Science, Technology, Energy, Engineering, and Math. And Mm -hmm. those of us in my field and in the performing arts education field fought for a couple decades to get the A, put it in STEM, and turn it to STEAM, Mm -hmm. A being for arts. Right. (laughs) And now it's kind of coming full circle. We have career technical uh, education opportunities, not every child is meant to go to college, so some of the shop classes and so forth are coming back. And at Delord High School, we put in a banish repair shop with eight repair stations. Dan's teaching two classes a day, and kids are going off to vocational technical wow. school 
and getting good paying jobs in the industry. Wow. There's wow. a high need for band instrument repair technicians. It's not that different from nursing. Pick your state, pick your city, you probably got a job. And How I know that is that. Who knows that information? Yes. Right? And that's one of four four programs in the United States at a high school like that. You're kidding. So very exciting. We're doing our best to bring it to other campuses. Dan's doing yeah. a great job of at conferences, regional conferences and national conferences talking about the value of that. And Corey's had students go off to vocational technical school for uh, band instrument repair as well. So Excellent. it's not all just about what happens on the stage. There are mm-hmm. a lot of peripheral. We can teach costumes, sets, sighting, lighting, sound, all those sort of things as well. And there are always positions opening up in the greater world for those kinds of things. I mean, set directors, they get big money. Yes. And the center also will have an opportunity to be used as a town hall meeting place. We look at the mm-hmm. fires that we had last August. Mm-hmm. And the the meeting place for the public was at the fairgrounds in Crescent City. That's also where the primary incident base was. Yep. One road in, one road out in the tsunami zone. Yep. Yeah, right. there's something not ideal about that. No. Yeah. But the, the school district uh, partners fairly equally with city and county for emergency services, food distribution, Correct. major data banks come into the, the school district and so forth. So having a town hall meeting place is, is uh, of high value there as well and can also be an advantage to Curry County. Yeah, it must have been a, a bit of a shock when that fire came so close for you guys. I mean, we, you know, up here in... Curry County, we didn't have quite the panic, but, you know, certainly people I knew in Smith River were not happy. No, it got it got uncomfortably close. Yep. Living in Santa Barbara, I got used to the fires. I can't say I got used to them, but I became accustomed to them. Right, right. They they got pretty close to our house Did a they? number of times. Yeah, it's, it's scary, and, and it's, not, it's not like it's going to stop, you know, these these fires are getting worse, you know, yes, they are. they're not getting better. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I remember when we had the Chetka Bar fire, and I think it was 2017, 2018, somewhere in there. And uh, yeah, where we met for information was Freddy's. <laughs> <laughs> there was a fireman there, and he had a map. And every day, you know, he'd, he'd be there. And you if you wanted information about the fire, you went to, to Freddy's and yeah. Talk to the fireman that was there. It's like, oh, can we not do better than this? I mean, come on, right? One would think, yes. Yeah. yeah. That's part of this vision that uh, partnership with the performing arts is when I was in high school back in the Paleozoic, we were <laughs> grumbling about doing concerts in the gym. Yeah. And here it is 60 years later, and we haven't fixed the problem. I know. I know. So we can do so many things. Why can't we do that for our kids? Del Norte doesn't have a conference center either, does it? Which, again, right? We have places to meet, but they're not, nothing is big enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, 250 people, 400 if you just get it totally stuffed. Mm-hmm. Uh, but acoustics aren't great. Sound reinforcement isn't great. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the things that they do have are in the tsunami zone, and especially... Crescent City, if it's going to get whacked by Mother Nature, it's probably going to be a tsunami as much yes. as anything else, right? So yes. We can't. We need something outside the tsunami zone. They have the cultural center downtown, and mm-hmm. all three casinos have meeting places. Mm-hmm. Uh, but how far does the that tsunami zone? How far does it go in? Well, the the sixty four tsunami went up three to five blocks into Crescent City, basically, but we don't know that that's the largest one out there. Right. So right. it extends far past that, but the, the high school is outside the tsunami zone. It's inside the city limits, but outside. So city's very interested in this project because mm-hmm. of the opportunity to use it as a town hall meeting place. And we can also bring in uh, speakers, lecturers, things mm-hmm. like that. We can, uh, with proper program director, we can talk to neighboring high schools throughout several counties in, in California and Oregon and say, we're going to bring in, looking at this person, this group, these folks, that lecturer, 
How many of you are interested? Because if we can do them all back to back and give them five or six instead of one, yep. we can probably cut the per, per performance cost in half. Right. And that means we have an even better opportunity to bring the world to an area that can't go to the world. Yep. Yep. So all the different opportunities, the way we can leverage what the Performing Arts Center can do for the area. It's just exciting to me. Yeah. And, Possibilities and it, are endless. And it will make a huge difference. I mean, it makes a huge difference in people's lives. You give them that glimpse of the outside world. You give them that ability to see the way other people think, the way other people sing, the way other people act. I mean, it's it really, it just, it broadens horizons a bit. And hospitality industry in Brookings as well as Crescent City, both communities, uh, the center will be a direct beneficiary because neither one has enough hotels. No. Or restaurants. Yep. But combined, they do a pretty good job. Yep. And it's, you know, it's a half an hour driving to get from here to Crescent City. It's like it's nothing. I mean, some of us have trouble going across the bridge, but, you know, <laughs> but most people have no trouble at all driving from Brookings to Crescent City. Yes, and I'm sure that uh, for performances, especially night performances that uh, cater more to the older population, that we will have transportation set up. Oh, with, what uh, a wonderful idea. That should be pretty easy to write grants for. So yeah. Redwood Coast Transfer, RCT, or whoever it happens to be, will right. have something so that we can bring people back and forth. Because it's true, those of us who are in our 70s, we would prefer to not drive at night. Yeah. I mean, we can do it if if we really have to, but, you know, we prefer not to. Correct. So that would be great, having transportation set up. Yes. Fabulous. Hmm. So you're... Counting on breaking ground in 26? The schedule is we're just about through with the design process. So because we're building on a school district property, that drives the cost up a lot because just the rules and regulations mm. for um, a school campus are much higher. Mm. And rightfully so. We mm -hmm. have to protect our kids. Right. But the... We plan to submit the uh, the plans of the center to the director of the state architect on Halloween this year. <laughs> Somehow that just seems delightful. <laughs> yes. And expect their uh, approval in July of next year. And then we will uh, put the project out to bid in mid-December we will award the bid. Uh, we'll put put the bid out in December and then review and approve in January with the school board. Great. And sh start construction shortly thereafter. That's about a 17, 18 month build. Now, you're going to be doing that during the rainy season. Does that uh, impact? I think we know about rain here. Do you think? Yeah. <laughs> that's, all, that's all dialed in, trust me. <laughs> I don't know. It surprises me every winter, I have to admit. It, 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 I, I keep thinking, oh, yeah, I know what rainy season is, right? No, no problem. And then I get to, like, middle of February, and it's like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing here? It's still rainy season. It is still raining, yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, it sounds very exciting, though. That, that just, mm. I mean, I can't wait to, like, sit in it and listen to an orchestra play. I mean, what a delight. That's one another project, by the way. We have a, uh, Corey Tamandong at Brookings Harbor High School brought orchestra back to this district seven years ago. And what a delight to hear that. And I knew from back in high school that Del Norte had had an orchestra, but I didn't know when. And I Thought and thought and thought. Who can fact check that for me? I remember, there's a lady. She's 98 years old, and she's a viola player, and wow. who's still active, and everything works and all. So I went to her. I said, "Was there a 
orchestra at the, at the high school. Yeah, Sonny, back in the 30s and 40s. <laughs> and uh, Wow, really? That long ago? So with the uh, assistance of the uh, Jeff Harris, the superintendent of schools and uh, district superintendent, uh, and Tom Kissinger, the assistant superintendent of education, I spoke with them and I said, what if, what, what if we start with the Crescent Elk Middle School and give them full instrumentation for an orchestra and then we'll work our way down to fourth grade and up to 12th grade. Wow. So we're going to start that this fall. The instruments are almost all here and ready to be played. And then not only do Corey and Dan, the two high schools, get to do their marching competitions and their jazz band competitions and their concert band and playing along or having having fun in different ways with each other. Now they'll be able to do orchestra back and forth as well. But I That's think Corey's going to win the uh, competitions for, well, he's got a seven-year head start. <laughs> Uh, well, that matters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. So what kind of help do you need to get this thing Well, in the going? perfect world, four or five of those angels would stop by and write checks for a total of about $20 million. So let's let's think about that for a moment because yeah. there's no there's no reason to just rush through that idea. So there are probably four or five individuals within our area, you know, who can actually hear this interview who could do that. So let's make that appeal, right? If you're yeah. able to do that, just come on in. Part, part of the magic of giving and this is something that I had to learn along the way. I didn't have any money growing up, so when I first got a little bit, it was tough to get, let go of it because I'd simply never had any before. Yep. But once I started to realize the power of giving it, uh, then I realized who wants to have it in their will? I want to see that it's properly uh, put to work and leveraged to maximum yep. ability while I'm still alive. And so you can watch the joy. Right. Yes. Yeah. Well, my wife and I have publicly pledged a million dollars to this project. Our entire estate will go to this project. We're worth more in, dead than alive on this project. <laughs> uh, Good but, for you, and thank you. That's but, wonderful. In, in the meantime, what I would say to those of high net worth mm -hmm. that could write these larger checks, doing it in your lifetime having a naming opportunity if that's important to you. Mm -hmm. So somebody could name the center, somebody could name the auditorium, somebody could name the lobby, mm -hmm. things of that nature. Yep. Those opportunities, you can't appreciate them. You can't be thanked for them. You can't watch the flowers blossom because you planted the seed if you're no longer around. That's right. That's right. So it's much more meaningful, uh, I feel, to be able to take care of these things while you're still alive. Set enough set 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 enough aside so that you can have cold prune juice when you're in your dotage <laughs> instead of warm prune juice. All I think that kind cold of stuff. prune juice is delicious. I don't know what to tell you. I think it's great. <laughs> so uh, No, that's that's great. And I, I agree with you. To be able to see the effects of your giving, to be able to see that, who could ask for more? Yes. I mean, that's, wow, that's significant. You know, that's a final act of kindness in one's life. Yeah, it really Consideration is. Consideration and all that. All right, so we've got the four angels, which, you know, come on, angels, step up. What, what can other people who don't quite have that, how can they help? The website for partnership for the performing arts is ppadelnort.org. So PPA stands for Partnership for the Performing Arts, ppadelnort.org. And yes, there is a button to push on the website that says donate. Yay! <laughs> and it works. <laughs> and it yeah. works, yeah, yes. There we go. <laughs> One thing we're doing that's very exciting, uh, it's going to come online pretty soon, I think within a month, is a classmate of mine owns Trees of Mystery. Oh. And they get a half a million people a year down there. Yeah. And we're going to have a nice little kiosk right by the sky gondola, uh -huh. the sky trail, where at high season you have to wait for two hours. Mm-hmm. 
And it's going to be a little short video. Perfect. Talking about the need in this county, these two counties for partnership yep. for the performing arts and Perfect. a QR code that people can click and donate on. So Perfect. Perfect. I think, and I know the movie theater here in town used to have a, a loop that played before the movies that had businesses that were advertising. So yes. that might be something as well. Yes. So... The capital campaign for the Performing Arts Center, that's the big picture. That's the mm-hmm. two front burners yep. on the stove. Raise the money and build the box. The back burners are all the other things that we do, figuring out how we have sustainability and how we yep. leverage the opportunity of making the box useful to as many people as possible. Yep. And to do that, as we plug along on our way to building the center, and after we build the center, We also need smaller donations just to stay in business. We do have employees for our organization, and we have costs associated with running a nonprofit. We're one of the larger nonprofits in the area. Mm -hmm. So a lot of moving parts to that. Mm -hmm. And um, Do you actually have volunteers that help with the nonprofit? We have a board of directors with 13 members on it, and... uh, We'll probably be growing that by a couple members, mm-hmm. uh, but 13 at this point. Great. And we have um, our list of uh, people who endorse us, organizations and, and agencies. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a it long on list. on and on. Yeah, that's great. On and on. So... Uh, and you gave a presentation at the at the Brookings City Council meeting a couple of weeks ago, and you know I I know that they're they don't have a whole lot of extra money, but but it was a great presentation, and I certainly hope that they are supportive of you. Yes, I'm sure they have a letter in the works. Mm-hmm. The, the the letter the letter of, of of support in and of itself from a city council. We have a. a Delaware uh, County Board of Supervisors mm-hmm. and their city council. We have letters from them, from the tribes, and so mm-hmm. forth and so on. Chambers, uh, Rotary, all those, uh, just a host of organizations. Yep. Uh, then when we're talking to a state or federal person, then uh, we can tell them that we've got these letters of support. And it's a qualifier. It legitimizes us Absolutely. immediately. E- even the the. F- Funders, you know the foundations. They they care about community support. That's really absolutely yes. All right, so I I hate to tell you this, Nick, but we're running out of time. Um, any last thoughts? Last thoughts are Lisa and I feel so privileged mm. to have the members of our team, our board of directors, the community, all these organizations and agencies to have you welcoming me here to speak on their behalf. The opportunity to do this uh, is such a privilege. It's it's likely to be the final chapter in my life, and I couldn't think of a better story ending. I agree. Being able to bring this center and this gift to our shared communities, it's uh, it's nothing less than a, 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 it's a privilege. Thank you, Nick Rail, for showing up for my show. It's been a great interview, and I appreciate your presence here. So thank you. Deep bows. And thank you for tuning in. I've been chatting with Nick Rail, the president of the Partnership for the Performing Arts. I'm Candace Michelle, and this is Our Community.